a series this morning on uh, the absolute most, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, despised topic that a preacher can ever speak on. Anybody want to take a guess what it is? Money. 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 We're going to talk for the next few weeks on giving and, and generosity. You know, and, and you know, as, as I've, I've been the pastor here for 26 years, and, and I've never in 26 years taken our giving records and gone through them and went, I want to see who gives what. I just haven't done that. Um, you know, and I don't plan on doing that. Okay? But I do, I do look at analytics and I look at, at statistics and I look at different things to kind of see where we are on the spectrum. And per capita, we are well above the national average. Well above it. And, and to God be the glory because you are a generous congregation. Uh, but I also found something, we looked at it here just a few months ago, that's very interesting. We have 200 donors at Generation United Church that give a total of $14 on average and 10 cents a month. $14 and 10 cents a month over a year is the average of 200 people that donate to Generation United Church. Now, let me tell you this. Thank you for your $14 and 10 cents a month. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, look, I'm not smacking anybody around. I'm just telling you thank you. But I'm gonna ask you over the next few weeks to go a little deeper. Let's see if we can't get to like $10 a week or something like that, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, and maybe what I have to say over the next few weeks with the help of the Holy Spirit, that maybe it'll generate uh, some, uh, um, I don't know, desire in you to kind of up your game a little bit when it comes to finances. Because here's the problem with, with a lot of us in church. We, we don't want people to be talking about giving in church because for some unknown reason, churches seem to think that, that God with his Holy Ghost gold dust just turns the lights on every month. Or that, that uh, the children's ministry and the student ministry and the small group ministry and all of these things uh, that, that somehow the money just appears in our bank account at Sonovus. And uh, because it, it's just a weird thing. It's a weird thing. You say, well, Phil, you're kind of being a butthead this morning a little bit. Um, no, not yet. <laughs> not yet. You know, and I, and I hope I'm not going to become that. I just, I just think that at Generations United Church, and those of you that may be watching this online, that if we take a look and understand that God does not make us personally responsible for the entire bill in any church. He doesn't hold us accountable for the entire deal. But he does look at us and go, I have given you this to do something with it. And that is to do your part. Now, if your part is $14.10 on average a month, then God bless you. God bless you. Serious. If, it, if, it's, if it's more than that, then you're going to have to ask yourself the question, what am I supposed to be doing? You know, I mean, we have taught tithing for years. Most of us teach tithing. Tithing is a tenth. of comes off the top of everything you earn. Take 10%, give it to the Lord. It's not, it's not a giving deal. It's a returning. The tithe belongs to the Lord, so we return it to the Lord. Generosity begins above that percentage, which is 10%. You say, well, I can't give 10% of my income. Okay, can you give 1%? Can you give 2 Can you start somewhere and see if God won't do something financially in your life that you never anticipated? See, that's the challenge that we face because here, here's, here's what I know. After 36 years of pastoral ministry, I can tell you that it is impossible to give at a level that God says, wow, I can't meet that. I just can't touch that because the, the truth of it is this, and this is the biblical truth. The biblical truth is God owns it all anyway. Amen. And he has allotted so much of it to us individually. And we have to decide how we're going to steward what he's allotted to us, depending on our particular situation. Money is an important subject. Uh, Dr. Warden was talking about uh, doing it, doing what, doing what the word says. Do it yourself. You've got to enact. You've got to 
get geared into and you've got to grab a hold to and you've got to take the word and you've got to operate within the word. You've got to obey what it says. If you don't, you can sit back and go, well, I just don't understand why God doesn't bless me. I don't understand why God doesn't bless me. I don't understand why God doesn't bless me. Well, are you putting yourself in the path of blessings? Are you putting yourself in a place where God can do the things? Well, he's, I see God opening the window of heaven up for this person, and they've just got all this stuff going on, but that never happens to me. Okay, I ask you again. Are you putting yourself in the path of blessings? Now, what you're not going to hear me say is, if you send us $1,000, that God's going to give you $100,000 in the next 30 days. Because that's a load of hooey. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible is not a book about prosperity. It's not a book that says, if you do this, I'm going to make you rich beyond your wildest dreams. What he says is, I'm going to prosper you as your soul prospers. And I will act in your life dependent upon how we uh, steward what God has given us. Money is an important subject. God says this, the root, the love of money is the root of all evils. It says that we shouldn't serve God and money, God and mammon. Jesus talked about money in 16 of 38 parables. One out of every 10 verses in the Gospels speaks of money and possessions. 200 verses on money and possessions in the Bible. I would say that God deems it as something that's important. When it comes to lordship, we have to be able to look at every area of our life and say and ask ourselves first this question. Is this area under the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Well, Lord, my children are under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. My marriage is under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. My home's under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And some of my finances are. Wrong answer. Is he Lord of your finances? Now, in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, it says, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, biblically, this passage is not necessarily speaking of money in, in its context. It's talking about forgiveness and condemnation and judgment. If you choose to judge somebody, the measure you use to judge someone is going to be used against you. If you choose to forgive or not forgive, the measure of forgiveness is used against you. But there's a principle here, and it's not the principle of giving as much as it is the principle of measure. For the measure you use will be measured against you, or be measured to you. Mark 12 says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. What is the measure of our love for God? All. All of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind, all of my strength. That is the measure. When it comes to treasure, he says this, Matthew 6, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you love God with all your heart, you have to look at that and determine what part of your treasure dictates your heart. Here's a statement. Here's a statement, and I believe it to be true. You cannot have a heart upright toward God without generosity and spirit and finance as well. Oh, I love God with my whole heart. Okay, where's your treasure? Where's your treasure? Because where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. You cannot have a greater heart for God than your finances bear witness to. It's impossible. When you buy stock, do you not check on it regularly? When you purchase from Amazon, do you not track it over and over and over and over and over again? Do you not track that over? You're constantly going, where's it, where's it at? Where's it? Oh, it's here. It left the shipping facility. Now it's in Akron, Ohio. Oh, my Lord, how did it get to Minneapolis? I don't know. Why did they send it over there? And you just look at it every day. Why? Because your money went toward it and your heart followed. Your heart followed. We care about where we put our money. Now, the, the foundation text for this next three weeks is found, it's the Christmas story. We're going to talk about uh, two passages, one in Matthew chapter 2 and one in Luke chapter 2. If you want to go ahead and get there, we're going to look at a couple of things, and then uh, we'll get into the, the nuts and bolts of what we're going to talk about today. Now, I will give you just a little bit of fair warning. Over the next few weeks, I'm going to really mess up your Christmas, okay? I'm going to mess up your nativity set. It, I'm, I'm going to jack it up so bad 
that some of you are just going to go, why did you do that? But we're going to look biblically, and we're going to see some things in Scripture that maybe you know, maybe you didn't, you know, but I can, I can really tell you that your nativity set with, with Mary Joseph, all the little animals and the, and the shepherds and the three wise men, it didn't go that way. It didn't go down like that, okay? And so you may have to remove parts of your nativity set by Christmas. I don't know. <laughs> depends, on, depends on how you feel about it. Luke 2, 21. On the eighth day when it was time to circumcise the child, his name was Jesus. or he, named, he was named Jesus. The name of the angel had given him before he was conceived. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law, Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what it is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of doves or two young pigeons. Matthew 2. Turn over there. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who had been born King of the Jews? We saw a star when it rose and have come to worship him. Jump down to verse 9. They go to meet Herod and all this kind of stuff. After they had heard the king, verse 9, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Get up, take the child and his mother, and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I call my son. Now, we're not going to deal with too much in the Matthew section today. That will be next week and then, and then the following Sunday. But today I want to talk to you about two things. I want to talk to you about contribution and capacity. I heard a teaching a couple of years ago by Pastor Levi Lusco, and he was, he was talking about revival, and he, just, he mentioned this in the teaching on revival, and I thought, wow, that would be a great stewardship uh, foundation for a stewardship series. And so I took that, and I'm, I'm kind of building, so I want to make sure I give Pastor Lusco some credit here because he, he's, the, he's the brain trust behind some of this. Contribution and capacity. Contribution is what you're giving. When you, when you text to give, when you go online and you have it drafted, when you write a check, whatever you, that's, the, that's what you have to give. The capacity, though, is what you've been given. Going back to Luke, we talk about Mary and Joseph, they, have to, they take Jesus for dedication at the temple. The law says that you're supposed to give, when you dedicate a child, you're supposed to have a lamb. You're supposed to give a lamb. But there's provision in the law for people who are poor. God thinks of everybody. There are people that could not afford a lamb. And so God gives them a way to still have their child dedicated and consecrated, and that is two doves or two, or two, two pigeons. Let's just use two turtle doves because doves are better. All right? I like doves. I don't care for pigeons. I make a mess. All right? So... They literally, because of their, their financial status, their, their economic status, they have to buy doves to take to the temple to give as a sacrifice at the dedication of their baby named Jesus. Now, you say, well, why did God do that? Because God is a God of justice, and God is also a God that understands that some people don't have the, the means to sacrifice the lamb, so he provides a way. Now, I'm not, this is not a message on tithing, but that's the beauty of the tithe, because the tithe is just across the board. You give 10%. If you have $90 million, and if you do, please begin to tithe. I mean, like right now. <laughs> right now. Generations United Church, give it. If you got $90 million or you got 90 cent, 10% is still 10%. And that's the baseline. Now, a lot of people get bound up in this and they find themselves and they look at it from, I don't want to live in the law. And we're not talking about living in the law because this is the whole purpose of this teaching. Recognizing what our capacity is so that we can in turn make a contribution based on our capacity. 
Leviticus 12 talks about this sacrifice. If she can't afford a lamb, she's to bring two doves or two young pigeons for the burnt offering. Mary and Joseph are poor. They are unbelievably poor. But they're participating at their personal level. Now, if you don't hear anything else that you hear this morning, you hear this. God never holds you accountable for what someone else has been given. And God measures your contribution against your capacity, not someone else's. Now, I want to try to do something up here on this platform this morning. I have two balloons. As worship was going on, I thought about this. I probably should have blew these things up before I got up here. <laughs> so I would last for two volunteers. <laughs> come here, buddy. Come here. Anybody else want to blow? Come here, Haley. Mm. <laughs> All right, blow them up. Don't pop them. Now that's going to pop. <laughs> Charles, you got her. If she falls, you got her, right? All right. All right. <laughs> you good? All right. Good job. Give them a hand, folks. Give them a hand. All right, here's the deal. Here's the deal. We have two different size balloons. You blow this up anymore, and it's going to be a very loud noise because it has reached its capacity. It's reached its capacity. This, on the other hand, is a much larger balloon. Now, it's pretty close to its capacity, but look at the size difference. It's the same way when we start talking about giving to the Lord. God is not looking for you to have a capacity the size of a red balloon if he hasn't given you that capacity. He's not looking for you that, that type of a contribution out of you. He is looking as, from the contribution standpoint of what he has given to you at your present state. As it increases, your contribution should go up. If it decreases, guess what happens? Your contribution goes down. Because God does not expect more from you than he has given you the capacity to contribute. That's the beauty of the way God works with our finances. We see an illustration of this in Luke chapter 12. There's a, there's a, Jesus is in the, in the church service, and he's standing there, and it's time to take up the offering. And he's watching these guys coming down. They're bringing basketfuls of coins and all kind of gifts, and they're bringing tons of money in there. And then in the middle of all that, there's this little tiny elderly lady, and she just comes down the aisle. She, I see her. She's got her little Hebrew walker thing. She's just, you know, she's just getting it down the aisle there. And she gets right there, and she just has two coins. They're called widow's mites. Now, they're, they're worth about a half a penny each. Now, as a tourist, if you try to buy some of those things over there, they cost you a lot more than that. But in those days, they're about worth a half a penny. And she comes in, and she walks up there with all these massive piles of monetary gifts, and she takes and she puts it there on the altar. And she leaves, and Jesus takes note of what's going on. And <laughs> he said this. He said, I tell you this, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. Now, you tell me how, how two half-cent widow's mites can be more than a basket full of gold coins. And then after, we've got, no, that's not possible. We look at people that have the means, the, the millions of dollars. They have the means to make such a huge difference because they have the means to give much. It's not about what your, your, your contribution is as much as it is your capacity. She gave her entire capacity. She gave every, Jesus said it. He said, look. He said, she has given more and put in more than all the others because all these people gave their gifts out of their wealth. But she has given out of her poverty. She put in all she had to live on. Now, I want you to understand this. God does not require you to give at that level. God didn't tell her, give everything you have. She chose to do that. She has a choice. She gave everything. She gave her entire capacity and her contribution. God's not calling us to do that. If he does, that's between you and God. But the Bible doesn't, doesn't call on us to do that. It's not 
about what you give, but it's about what you have that God has given you. He measures your contribution against your capacity. Just because you can't give a big gift doesn't mean you can't make a big difference. More than 200 donors give $14 and 10, on average, $14 and 10 cents a month in this church. And we can look at that and go, man, that's, that's just not a lot of money. Or we can go, wow, 200 people give $14 and 10 cents a month. And we can celebrate the gift. If that's you that falls in that category, here's what I ask you to do. Measure your gift against what you've been given. And give according to your capacity. If those 14 people or those, those 200 people give, move theirs from 14, average for $14 a month to an average of $40 a month, then the increase in finances at, at Generations United Church is over $70,000 a year increase, just there. If you just add $26 a month to your giving. Are well, you telling me I should add $26? I'm telling you, measure your contribution against your capacity. Look at your capacity. Give accordingly. Some of you have really big balloons. Your bank account's a really big bank account. You have the financial means to do more. Give according to that. What God has given you, you give in accordance with that. It's the measure that's important. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 9. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly, nor under compulsion. Well, Phil, you're really twisting our arms today. I'm not. I'm celebrating the fact that we have more than 200 people in this church that give something every single solitary month. To me, I say, yay, God, and yay, you. Yay. Because I remember a time not too long ago when more than 50% of this church gave zero to this church every year. Now, we are well beyond, above the, the national average in per capita giving. All I'm asking you to this, to this morning is to begin to look and think about this over the next few weeks. Are you contributing in line with your capacity? Are you giving out of what you have? And when you give, give cheerfully. For God loves a cheerful giver. Verse 8, and God is able to bless abundantly so that in all things at all times, notice this, all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, you have freely, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and you will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So what is he saying here? You want to enlarge your capacity, you have to enlarge your contribution. You give out of your capacity, God honors that, God sees that, God expands your capacity so that you can give. Right now you might be the white balloon. Someday you may be the red balloon if you, if you live in, in obedience to God's word. All I'm saying is this, God wants to bless us, but he blesses us as we walk in obedience to him. You give what you've decided in your heart. Remember the measure. Remember the measure. You say, well, I'm not sure that's biblical. Phil, is it really about our income? Well, I don't know. Paul said this on 1 Corinthians 16. He said, on the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. So it's not Phil telling you this. This is, this is the Bible. This is the do-it-yourself guide to financial stuff. Are you going to do it yourself? Set aside it on the first day of the week. What's the first day of the week? Is it Monday? No. Is it Saturday? No. It's what? Sunday. When do we come to church? Oh, Sunday. First day of the week. Set it aside. Contribution and capacity. And here's what I know, and Paul, Paul emphasizes this in 2 Corinthians. He says this, if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. What's he saying? Are you giving according to your capacity? 
Contribution is what you give. The measure is what you've been given. We give in accordance with what we have been given by God. And that's it. And I'm done. I'm done. Come on. Give the Lord a hand. Now, I'm going to ask Tommy to come here in just a second. He's, going to, he's got some announcements. We're going to take up the offering. Yeah. Yeah. You say, well, you're kind of twisting our arm this morning. I'm not twisting your arm. I'm just giving you the word of God. You've got to decide to look at your capacity. And when you see your capacity, you've got to determine if you're going to give and contribute accordingly. My hope and prayer is that you will, allow, that you will do that and allow God to enlarge your capacity beyond your wildest imaginations. Let me pray for you.